Hi, my name is Pam Ozenkowski, and I'm a science advisor for the National Anti-Vivisection Society, as well as the International Foundation for Ethical Research. Today, NAVS is honored to interview Dr. Pandora Pound, Research Director for Safer Medicines Trust, a UK-based patient safety charity. Dr. Pound recently published a new book entitled Rat Trap, The Capture of Medicine by Animal Research and How to Break Free. In her book, Dr. Pound provides an insightful overview of how animal research became so ingrained in science, and she writes a very compelling argument about why we should reduce reliance on animal models. She discusses important limitations of animal research that can't simply be improved by better quality studies, and importantly, she discusses exciting human-relevant technologies that are available that can reduce reliance on animal models. We are really excited to speak with her today. So thank you so much, Dr. Pound, for sharing your time and expertise with us today. Thanks very much for the opportunity, Pam. No, I really appreciate it. Thank you. So some of us on the NAVS team came up with a list of questions pertaining to your new book, and we're hoping today that we can just do a quick Q&A with you about that material. Sure. So if you don't mind, I'll start with the first question. So it seems that some in the scientific community want the general public to believe that scientific advancement would come to a screeching halt if animal research came to an end. Of course, we at NAVS don't think that would be the case. What impact do you believe breaking free from the traditional reliance on animal models and science could have on both scientific research and the welfare of animals? Well, of course, I think that it will really free science up, you know, to allow us to explore some of the, um, the new technologies and approaches, because we know there's really no need to study animals and then extrapolate the findings to humans. Um, because that can just lead to so much uncertainty and lack of reliability when interpreting the findings. I mean, not only due to species differences, but also the inability of animal models to uh, replicate the, the human context of disease and also uh, the inability of animal samples which are very homogeneous to to actually represent diverse human populations so there are lots of reasons why it doesn't make sense to to use animals and then try and generalize the findings to humans and of course if we study humans or human tissues and cells directly the findings are going to be directly relevant um, and so Breaking free from reliance on animal models will also free up resources that could be used to really try and explore the potential of these new approaches. Um, and of course, it will benefit animals because they will no longer have to be used in these unnecessary and harmful experiments. So I think it would be a great thing. Oh, we, we couldn't agree more. And we definitely think like you do that we need a better return on our investment. We're spending so, many, so much time, money, resources on animal experiments. And it seems like if we had an opportunity to divert that money into more human relevant technologies, I think we'd see advancements a lot quicker than we have uh, in current time. So thank you for that. Um, this one also, I think, is a pretty interesting question because as you know, scientists are trained to make conclusions based on fact. But we also know that there's a really high failure rates of drugs that have passed preclinical animal tests, that there's a really low number of treatments and cures for common diseases. And also you've contributed to this field where meta-analyses keep demonstrating limitations with translatability of animal models. So why do you think so many in the scientific community still support using animal models as strongly as they do? Um, I think it's partly because, well, scientists are very conservative. Um, their training is very, I mean, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but the training is very fact-based. It's very textbook-based. You know, it, well, unlike in other disciplines that are exposed to um, a wide variety of different ideas and challenges, that isn't the case um, with science. Um, and so they may simply be more comfortable with the devil they know, you know, even though there are lots of uncertainties involved in that. But it's also the case that evidence alone isn't enough. You know, it's a small part of the picture, but it's um, only a part of the picture, which is much wider. So we have to look at society and institutional sort of levels as well, because evidence has to be seen in that context. And of course, we know that there are societal and institutional obstacles like regulation, like funding, 
um, like the fact that you know animal research has been embedded in our institutions for decades and you know lots of people's incomes and livelihoods depend upon it so unfortunately although evidence is vitally important it is only a you know a part of the whole picture mm -hmm. No, we appreciate you trying to put some of the evidence together as you have in Rat Trap to make it uh, easier for people to understand the complexity of this issue. And it does provide that compelling evidence. But as you point out, um, we've got a bit of an uphill battle due to some, some other uh, issues, but certainly the evidence is in our favor for not um, supporting the continued reliance on animal models and science. One of the challenges we see today here at NAVS is a lot of scientists are excited about the development of non-animal methods, but they seem to view them as complements to existing animal tests and not as replacements for them. So what do you think about that topic and what can we do to have more people view these non-animal methods as actual replacements for current, currently used animal models? Well, I mean, I think that they are viewed as complements only by those people who see who still see animal research as the gold standard. So that's the way they just judge everything else um, by this gold standard. Um, and, and I think partly they believe animal research is still the gold standard because they have this strong belief that this whole body system, this whole living organism is very important. Um, and of course, the whole body system is great, but it's not so great if it's the wrong body. Um, and so, you know, no matter how much we find in animal bodies, um, it's human bodies that we need to know about. So nowadays we've got the option of studying the human body in, in so many new and exciting ways, um, you know, using combinations of different approaches. So combinations of in vitro approaches combined with AI or in silico. Um, there are just some amazing um, new approaches, you know, like digital twins or virtual humans. Uh, these very personalized approaches as well. Um, so, you know, I think a lot of the difficulties of modeling whole human systems have been overcome and these solutions are cont continually emerging and improving. Um, you've just listed some exciting uh, alternatives in your previous response. And I think in your rat trap book, you do a really nice job of sharing with others some of the new research methods that are available that can serve as viable replacements for animal testing. Of the ones that you've just mentioned and spoke about, are there any that excite you the most as viable replacements for animal models? Um, I think I think they're all exciting, but what I really like is just a change in the way we think, really. And for me, um, I really like approaches that are trying to identify the very earliest signs of disease and trying to intervene there. I mean, at the moment, animal models tend to focus on disease when it's very advanced, like, you know, with cancer models or stroke. Um, and at that point, the disease has already really got its, you know, claws into us. And so any interventions are going to be quite invasive, probably. But if we were able to sort of um, identify the very first footprints of these diseases and intervene then, then those, you know, those interventions are going to be much less invasive and probably much more successful. So I really like approaches that are trying to, to look at the first signs of Alzheimer's or cancer um, and trying to intervene there. And at the moment, there is a blood test being um, trialled on the NHS here in the UK, which is looking at a way of identifying um, cancer with you know very early signs of cancer with one you know single blood test but looking at 50 different cancers with one blood test including those that are you know very hard to, to um, diagnose and so if you can you know you can imagine what a game changer that would be if it was successful and, and that blood test was developed on the basis of human um, biology based research carried out by um, Professor Azra Raza in the United States. So for me, that, yes, it's not just a change in technology, but a change in the way we think, really. Yeah. So that's a real paradigm change, I think. And I think that would be enormously successful. I, I agree. I think that makes a, a lot of sense to start early. Um, so we have a, a better chance of helping these individuals that, that have these conditions. Absolutely. 
Um, one thing that we've loved uh, about the work you've done, Dr. Pound, because you've had your finger on the pulse of this animal experimentation for many decades, is you have a, a good perspective on, on what's happening uh, in this realm. Um, we believe at NAVS the tides are really turning and in favor of animals because here in the U.S., uh, Gallup polls have been showing less public support for medical testing on animals over the last decade. This year in 2023, for the first time, the percent of Americans who found medical testing on animals as morally acceptable was the same that found it morally wrong. And if the trend continues here, the majority of Americans will view medical testing on animals as morally wrong in the near future. So this question has two parts to it. Uh, what do you think has caused public perception on animal research to change? And also what can we do to keep that trend moving in the right direction? Well, I mean, I think it, you know, it's been the combined efforts of organizations such as yours um, and the efforts of scientists who are exposing the limitations of animal research, as well as those who are developing and publicizing the benefits of new technologies. So all these different people sort of um, combining to, to play a part. Uh, but there's also, I think, a greater concern for the fate of animals used in research. There's more awareness of animal sentience. I think that's important. Um, maybe less trust in scientists and experts. So, um, you know, we don't tend to believe everything now that, that scientists tell us. So that, I think those may have caused some sort of shift in public perception. I mean, in terms of trying to keep the trend going in that direction, yeah, we still need to reach out to um, members of the public. I think there's a sort of sizable proportion that still believe that animal research is been, you know, absolutely vital for for human um, for um, medical progress. You know, it's a necessary evil, but it's it's quite difficult to reach some parts of the population and explain the arguments to them. I think that's the real challenge because once there's a sizable sort of public support, it'll be very hard to ignore. But it's just reaching out to to everyone really and trying to. Um, trying to get everyone on board, which is partly why I wrote the book, because I really wanted to get it out of the sort of scientific journals and into the, the public domain, really. If I just think you've done a great job of making this information accessible, because you're right, because a lot of times it's written in that scientific language that only scientists can understand, but you've written it for the layman, you've written it for somebody that is an animal advocate that's really well aware of the issues. So I think you've done a fantastic job and we need more people to read the book and to get, yes. you know, uh, fired up about what's happening and hopefully that will create a stir um, that will help benefit the animals, absolutely. And then our last question for you today is, uh, NAV supporters are, animal advocates and they're always looking for ways that they can help the animals. Uh, what do you think our supporters and the general public can do to become stronger advocates for animals? Well, I'm probably not the best path person to ask about that because at Safer Medicines, we focus on, you know, the, the effects that animal research has on humans, but it may also answer your question because I think once people understand that it isn't just about animals, that um, in fact, animal, of course, animal research harms animals. And, you know, we need to be concerned about that, but it also harms us because it fails to ensure the safety of new medicines. It fails to generate treatments, even for our most common diseases. So perhaps when, you know, more people realize that it uh, affects them and their families and their loved ones, um, that they will be more inclined to take action because, you know, when we get ill or people we love get ill, there's often very little that can be done, you know, even for really common things, you know, obviously like Alzheimer's and stroke and many cancers. So I think getting that uh, message out is really important as well, because some people do care more about humans than animals, and we need to show that it affects all of us. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point. Well, thank you, Dr. Pound, so much for your time today. And for those watching, please be sure to grab a copy of Rat Trap, 
It's a very, very good read and it very nicely puts together all of the issues related to animal experimentation. Um, and it also teaches us about some of the new alternatives that are available to advance science in a human relevant way. So thank you so much, Dr. Pound. Well, thank you very much, Pam. No, I really enjoyed it. Thank you.